Okay, so uh, hi everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, a lot of people today in our uh, APOP lunchtime presentation. Today, uh, our uh, we invited a very special person, Stephen Downs from the NRC in uh, Moncton. And uh, I hope you have a lot of fun today, learning a lot of new stuff from Stephen. Let's wait a little bit more, like uh, maybe two minutes more, or better can start. Some people are still coming. And uh, before we start, I'm going to make a <coughs> presentation. So our uh, Stephen Downs uh, was born in Montreal and lives in Moncton, New Brunswick, where he works for the National Research Council of Canada as a senior research since 2001. Uh, affiliated with the Learning Collaborative Technology Group, Institute for Information Technology, uh, Mr. Downs is specialized in the fields of online learning, new media, pedagogy, and philosophy. Mr. Downs is perhaps uh, best known for his daily newsletter, OL Daily, which is distributed by web, email, and RSS feed to thousands of subscribers around the world. He has published numerous articles, both online and in print, including The Future of Online Learning, 1998, Learning Objects 2000, Resource Profiles 2003, and eLearning 2.0 2005. He's a very popular speaker, appearing at hundreds of events around the world and over the last 15, 15 years. Prior to joining uh, the NRC, Mr. Downs worked for the University of Alberta as an information architect, and prior to that, as a distance education and new media design and specialist for a Boyne Community College in Brando, Manitoba. This followed a decade of teaching experience, both in person and by distance, with Athabasca University, the University of Alberta, and Grand Prairie uh, Regional College. And today, uh, Mr. Downs is going to tell us about decentralized learning. Uh, he will explore the idea of decentralized learning, and this model pioneered in such events as the Connectivism and Connective Knowledge course. Uh, revolves uh, around the idea that there is no core content which must be learned, but rather a body of loosely related materials that different people explore in different ways in order to satisfy their own personal learning needs. So uh, I'll pass the word right now to Mr. Stephen Dunn. Thank you very much for accepting right. our accepting invitation. Our it's invitation. a great pleasure it's for us having you here today. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you very and, much. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, first, I want to check and. Uh, Make sure you can hear me. Um, can you hear me okay? And all those hands going up and thumbs and that, I take signify yes. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Um, any more? No, that's all? Okay, good. Uh, I want to talk today about the uh, topic of decentralized learning, and uh, I'm, go I'm going to ask that if anybody still has their microphone open, uh, to close the microphone, and that way uh, that'll take care of some of the background noise that you may be hearing on the uh, presentation. That's excellent. Thank you very much. You should feel free at any time during the presentation to open up your microphone again and chip in with a comment or a question or a criticism or anything like that, please feel free to do so. This is um, this session is for your benefit and the whole purpose of doing it live like this is so that we can have uh, opportunity for some conversation and exchange and this will allow for that. I do have slides and a talk presented or prepared and uh, so you know I'll, I'll probably follow that order but I do want you all to feel free to change the direction, the, the tone, uh, the content of the talk in any way that seems appropriate to you. I'd like to as much as possible adapt to your needs as we go through the uh, presentation. The subject of the talk today is decentralized learning and uh, you can see from the abstract the model pioneered in such events as the connectivism and connective knowledge course revolves around the idea that there's no core content but rather a body of loosely related materials that different people explore in different ways. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the concept of decentralized learning from four major perspectives. First of all, I'm going to look at the actual physical organization of a decentralized learning course. Uh, 
Then I'm going to talk about the epistemology or the philosophy of knowledge that underlies decentralized learning. From that, I'm going to move into the pedagogy of decentralized learning, um, which I also characterize as the pedagogy of, of personal learning. And then finally, more briefly, I'll look at some success factors. What design parameters should we use in order to successfully implement decentralized learning? So the idea of, of decentralized learning physically is that the learning environment itself is distributed across a number of different sources. Uh, it's very often contrasted to the learning management system where students access a single computer system or a single resource and get all of their learning from that resource. So they, they log on to one place, all of the learning content is in that place, all of the discussion is in that place, and they use the same interface as everyone else and communicate in the same places. Oh, just as an aside, I'm recovering from a cold. If I suddenly disappear, it's because I'm sneezing. <laughs> Uh, I'm just, just warning ahead of time, just in case. Um, so the idea of a, a decentralized learning is that the students access different systems, different places. The role of the student isn't simply to connect to the one place and take part in your typical traditional learning experience, but rather to connect to different content sources, different places where they can interact with people to draw from these different sources, learning resources as needed. The, the physical model is probably most uh, succinctly stated in Scott Wilson's now famous uh, future VLE diagram. And this future VLE diagram has come to characterize what we call the personal learning environment. And the, the uh, now, does that arrow work? Or, uh, I don't know if you can see the hand or not. I can, can wave the hand, but can you see the hand? I don't know. I'll use, I'll use a pencil. It'll be easier. The uh, future VLE in the center is actually the learner. It is the person working in their own environment. And the idea of decentralized learning is that they connect to remote sources, uh, sources like Flickr, sources like 43 Things, which is a to-do list, uh, sources like personal hosting, a learning management system, a blogging system. And the idea is that they draw from these sources different resources, they work with these resources, and they distribute them back to these different, uh, different sources. The personal learning environment, which is the thing at the center of that diagram, is probably best thought of as an ecology in which uh, learning takes place. It's best represented as the student being thought of at the center and then being surrounded by a bunch of different resources. But really, when you think of it, when you think of an environment with multiple students, it's actually a mesh, right? Student, 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 student. Here they are, they're all interconnected with each other. So, oh, oh I see. So student, 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 student. And they're all interconnected in this mesh with each other. Okay, I really can't draw. <laughs> I'll go back to the document. Uh, Although I could use the little circle thing. Uh, okay. uh, an early example of a personal learning environment is Plex. And this was developed by Scott Wilson and the other people at CETUS in Britain. And you can see here they're drawing in resources, bringing them in. And it looks a lot like a file system where you, you, you basically load files from these uh, distributed places, bring them into a single environment, and then work with them. Personally, I found this looked a little bit too much like Windows Explorer to be a good personal learning environment. The sort of system that I built uh, was called MyGlue. And what my glue does is it takes feeds, RSS feeds from different locations, joins them together into a single big feed, allows you to filter that feed, and then edit it for output. 
drawing on, on that idea and other ideas, Scott Wilson came back with another project that he called Feed Forward. And here again, we have the, the different locations, um, uh, a, a blogging uh, platform, SWORD, which is a uh, type of learning object repository, uh, training website, Magnolia, which is a bookmark site, aggregating all of those things together and again having an area in which you can edit them and work with them. The idea here is that knowledge is created and shared by an interconnecting community of learners. The, the knowledge isn't just simply stored in books. It isn't simply stored in databases, but rather it's distributed across the community and it's created by this conversation and interaction. It's, it's an iterative, reiterative process. In a distributed environment like this, the role of the learner isn't simply to sit there and absorb content. The idea here is that they're supposed to participate and engage in a community where this participation is guided by their personal interest and their personal motivation. And you know, I always think of the discussion list, they're not so, they're not so prominent now as they used to be, but uh, the old Yahoo groups or even the Google groups where people would log on to these groups. They would engage and participate in this online discussion. Each person that logged on to these things would uh, have their own motivations, their own needs, their own interests. You still see that in the mailing list to some degree, uh, where people have signed up for a mailing list and they they have conversed back and forth. And uh, again, everybody has their own individual motivation. It's not like everybody is trying to do the same thing, but each person is doing his or her own thing. Uh, so it resembles to a large degree the model uh, of a community of practice, as, as described by Lavin Wenger, for example, um, but, but not hierarchical, rather more distributed with each person doing their own thing. Now, a couple of years ago, George Siemens and I decided to implement this theory in practice, and we set up a course uh, called Connectivism and Connective Knowledge. And it really gave us a really good example of such a learning network. And what we did is we set up these distributed resources, or more accurately, we identified a set of distributed resources and pointed to them uh, to the students. And then we stepped through a body of materials. But what we told the students was there's no right way to interact with all of this. Uh, there's no specific set of things that you have to do. There's no common readings that everybody must read. Uh, the idea here was that each person would participate in the materials in their own way. And it became very evident early on in this course that this is what had to be the case. There were 2,200 people signed up for the course. Not quite that many participated actively, but at the beginning of the course especially, we had hundreds of people actively contributing, actively creating content, plus George creating content, plus me creating content. There was no way that any person, including us, could read and assimilate the entire body of knowledge, the entire body of content that was in the course. So each person necessarily had to read or look at or watch a subset of that. And then what would happen is each person would have their own perspective on the material and then they would get in, involved in discussions, in exchanges. And new ideas, new ways of seeing would occur when people from these different perspectives interacted with each other. Connectivism uh, it was kind of we, we sort of, uh, how do I want to say this? I don't have the exact phrase in my mind. It was kind of interesting because the topic of the connectivism course was connectivism. So, you know, it was recursion of the first order there. But the idea here is that, the idea of connectivism is that knowledge is distributed across a network of connections and therefore that learning consists of the ability to construct and traverse those networks and that packs a lot 
into a single fairly simple statement but the picture of knowledge that it, that it presents is really important because we, we typically think of of knowledge is something that's self-contained. Knowledge is something like a sentence, like Paris is the capital of France. But in fact, what connectivism is saying is that knowledge, even of simple things like Paris is the capital of France, is actually composed of many discrete parts which may be located in different places, which may be scattered around the world, in fact. There's different ways you can interpret this. One way of interpreting this is to think of knowledge as contained in different peoples. Uh, George likes to say, I keep my knowledge in my friends. I don't say it quite like that, but it still, it, it captures that sort of idea. Um, and, and the idea here is that there's no one place where this knowledge is. I sometimes use the example of knowledge as being like the knowledge of how to fly a 747 from Paris to Montreal. I'm using Montreal because you're all in Montreal, right? Okay. Uh, and there's no one person who has all that knowledge because when you think of it, what's involved is how to make airplanes, how to make airplane tires, how to fly airplanes, how to uh, get fuel for airplanes, how to refuel airplanes, how to load baggage, how to land airplanes, all of that stuff. It takes an entire team of people to hold all the knowledge that's involved in flying from Paris to Montreal. Another way of looking at it is that the knowledge that we have in our head is also distributed across a network of connections. We know that we have neurons in our head, that our brains are composed of a dense mesh of interconnected neurons. We do not have anywhere in our head the sentence, Paris Paris is the capital of France. Rather, the knowledge, properly so called, that Paris is the capital of France is actually contained in, in tens of thousands, maybe millions of individual distinct neurons. So, with that theory, we set up the different course components. So you, when you see the physical setup here, you see that we have a bit here, a bit here, a bit here, a bit here, and the idea is to draw connections between all of these things. For example, we have the wiki, which had the overall structure of the course that we were distributing. We had the course Moodle forum, where people could log on and have a threaded discussion with each other. Uh, but that was just the beginning. If you looked at all of the different components that we set up, this is George and I, you can see from this diagram here, this is an actual diagram of the Connectivism 2008 course that was created by a student of the parts that George and I set up. And that what happened during the course of the course is that students started building their own resources around it and connecting it to them. I still can't draw circles with a mouse. I should just stop trying. <laughs> um, and so, for example, we had 170 students in the course who were actively blogging. And so we had 170 active blogs plugged in or connected to the course. And they connected into the RSS aggregator and were distributed to the rest of the course members using the RSS feed. If you want later on, I can actually show you that, show you how that worked from the inside. The idea here is that connectivism is a theory of learning by engagement. There's no curriculum, no theory, no body of knowledge, or more accurately, the the curriculum, the knowledge is what is sometimes called the MacGuffin. What a MacGuffin is, it's a, it's a term from uh, movie making. A MacGuffin is the, the, the item around which the whole plot revolves. Uh, in the Maltese Falcon, for example, uh, the actual Falcon is the MacGuffin. Um, you know, in, in a murder mystery, the dagger uh, might be a MacGuffin. Uh, the idea here is that all the plot, all the interest revolves around this one thing that is central. The actual nature of the thing is almost incidental usually. But, and, and what's important is the interaction and the dialogue that takes place around it. 
the the product in connectivism is is not some standalone thing that we call knowledge. The product is the learner, and and I'll explain more about what I mean by that as this as this uh, talk continues. So, participation in a connectivist course is a matter of active engagement, not passive observation. Uh, it's a bit like actor network theory, but we don't presume a commonality of translation here. We don't presume a common language. We don't presume common grounds, common understandings. It's a bit like action resor uh, research, but there's no presumption here that everybody is doing the same sort of research. In a connectivist course, we think of teachers as nodes, students as nodes, and teaching and learning consists of these nodes sending and receiving communications with each other in this network of connections. I'm getting better with those circles. I hope you're enjoying them. And so the methodology, oh, I'm missing a word. I don't know how I came to miss that word. I can probably type this, couldn't I? There we go. Aggregate, remix, repurpose, feed forward. If you are a student, a node, in a connectivist course, the idea is that you are bringing content in, you're remixing it, you're repurposing it, and then you're feeding it forward. And this process, this action of participating in the community is what develops in you the, the neural network, the, the, the knowledge that is shared by members of the community. So let me move now from this physical level of description to the epistemological level of description. And the way I want to approach that today is to think of two different ways of talking about learning. And, and these ways of talking about learning are, are probably going to be pretty familiar to anybody who has been involved in education research or in pedagogy. And that's to contrast between knowledge transmission and knowledge production. Knowledge transmission, uh, well, it's, it's got its roots. Uh, it has its roots in information theory. Uh, the, the idea of learning as the, re, is, as the reception of content or knowledge or information from a teacher. Uh, theories like Moore's theories, his transactional theory of distance learning is a transmission theory where uh, a message is sent, and then a message is sent back to confirm receipt, and you have your back and forth interaction. And the whole idea is of this whole transaction process is to reduce the possibility of error in the reception of the message. This is contrasted with a view of, of learning where the content, the learning, the knowledge is not received by the learner, but is actually produced in some way by the learner. And of course, anyone who's familiar with pedagogical theory will be familiar with, say, constructivism and the idea that people construct their own meaning. They construct their own learning through various practices. And then you have different kinds of, of constructivism, which will focus on different kinds of practices. The distributed model that I'm talking about here is not a transmission model. Rather, it draws on learner-centered and constructivist models. Uh, this is a, a diagram that uh, Harold Jarkey actually just produced today. And what he's doing here is he's talking about the ways that knowledge is produced through this process of aggregation, remixing, repurposing, and feed forwarding. Only he's, he's presenting it in, in, uh, in the light of his own research. And what, what he's been working on recently, and, and other people have been talking about recently, is this whole idea of knowledge production as being a process of seeking it, 
filtering it in some way and then sharing it with others and this this creates social knowledge production and each person in a social network would go through this process now i i look at that and i say something along the lines of well yeah that's partially right but it doesn't take it as far as it should go and so what i want to do is to focus on different models that we might have of knowledge production one way of looking at knowledge production is to think of it as like a type of mining uh and, and you know you get uh Oh, my picture ended up over my text in the conversion pro. That's why they told me yesterday to use PDFs and not PowerPoints, but I ignored them. And look what happened. Uh, the pictures have gone over the text. That's what I get for not following instructions. Sorry about that. Um, uh, so this is entirely my fault. Uh, so anyhow, yeah, knowledge production is mining. It's like data mining, for example. And the idea here is that you're drawing data from the world like a raw material that is searched for and retrieved and you maybe you assess it for quality and you remix it to form alloys and you add value by creating more and more refined metals and compounds uh, and materials that are scarce otherwise so the the value is produced by the refining the the assessing and the scarcity of the quality material that you're producing but that's not the only model of knowledge production from data another model is construction where data is like you see the pictures over the writing again right uh, data is like raw material but instead of simply filtering it and refining it you actually work with it work with your hands with it and, and create something new and what you're doing to the raw material is you're adding to it form and function and, and this is what is meant when people talk about making meaning uh you're 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 taking this raw material and you're giving it the capacity to function not simply as raw material but also as representational material uh, representational material in the sense that you can use this data in order to satisfy objectives to do things to perform functions so any time you have the raw material you'll have not just the raw material but its semantic component a third model is knowledge production as growing and, and honestly this is the form of knowledge production that I'm most partial to here the data is more like raw material that serves as a nutrient or growth medium and knowledge consists not of manipulating this and then passing it forward rather the raw material nourishes and contributes to the growth of the organism itself and then the organism creates something new and original and feeds that forward. Now, each of these different models, mining, construction, and growth, result in the creation of knowledge, but they, they represent a different emphasis. Mining, if, if you take a, a knowledge production as data mining approach, you're going to be more interested in the accuracy, more interested in, in the purity of the knowledge resources that are produced. In construction, because construction is based on semantics, is based on meaning, things like sameness and identity and standards and, and, and common language are going to become that much more important. The, the, the significance of a sign is going to have to be roughly the same between sender and receiver. In growth, the emphasis is going to be on creation and creativity. The, uh, in, in, in growth, we're interested in how the, the, how the uh, creator, the knowledge miner, him or herself, changes as a result of this input and as, uh, as uh, instantiated something happened at the bottom of my screen it sort of distracted me uh, as I guess something that was uploaded uh, as instantiated by the uh, by the creative artifact 
But that said, each of these things depends in some way on the other. Filtering requires some sort of sense of purpose. Otherwise, why are you filtering? Uh, construction depends on the capacity to create. In, in a certain sense, the meaning that we make is independent of the growth that we undergo while we're making meaning. And growth itself requires filtering and selection and the creativity, the, the creative product that a person creates through a learning process will itself have some sort of semantic import. And this leads us to the pedagogy. Uh, and and the, the pedagogy of, of distributed learning is based on the idea of what it is that we're doing, how it is that we're using this network in order to create learning, how it is we're using this distributed environment of multiple sources of information, multiple contact points in order to produce learning. And again, I sort of take the perspective of organic learning as, if you will, my home perspective, as the point of view that, that I prefer. Although that said, uh, I think that this perspective is still informed and requires elements of the mining perspective and the construction perspective. But my emphasis is on the, the growth perspective. So now typically, our next step when we talk about learning in one of these social network environments is to talk about some form of social learning. So some form of learning where the discussion uh, and the elements of learning happen in a common social space. And, and these are all approaches that, again, will be familiar to people who have studied learning. Uh, behaviorism, instructivism, interaction, interaction theory, social constructivism, all of these are social forms of learning. All of these are external forms of learning where uh, the, the body of knowledge, the learning objectives, the, prax uh, the processes, the activities, all of this takes place outside the individual person and so the entire discussion of learning what's happening what we're attempting to do is a discussion of things that happen outside the individual person uh, it's almost as if when we're talking about these kinds of learning theories that the human mind is thought of as a black box we we go through all of these social processes and that results in black box processes that create knowledge of some sort. But my feeling is if knowledge is growth, then social knowledge is not personal knowledge. I, I see my slide has uh, gone down off the bottom, but that's okay. Uh, you can sort of mostly get it. Uh, personal learning personal knowledge management is uh, sorry this the slide really doesn't make sense with the last sentence is gone but what, what I'm trying to say here is that learning is a matter of personal knowledge management personal knowledge production personal growth and that's contrasted with social knowledge management social knowledge production which we might characterize as something like research oh and there's I'm a person the, so sorry, I'm the, sorry, I, 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 I did I, the, the I, I did PDF the version, PDF of your PowerPoint version of your PowerPoint on the document on section. The document section oh okay yeah Very so good. I'll yeah. just so put I'll it on just put it on yes fabulous so, so um, Page 30. Page 30. Thank you very much. That, that's excellently done. So, yeah. So, what we want to say is that the product, uh, even of a distributed social educational system, is not a social outcome, but a personal outcome. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, something like this. We're using one of these. There we go. One of these, a social network, in order to produce one of these, a neural network. Personal knowledge consists of neural connections, 
not as people like George Siemens and others sometimes say, social connections. We're creating this, we're producing personal growth by activities here in a social network. The learning outcome from such a process is, as I've indicated previously, not going to be simple. It is going to be complex. When we're just simply representing learning and, and, and learning in a social network as uh, just the communications that happen between members of those networks, then we're tempted to think learn, of, of learning and learning outcomes as something simple like a sentence, like Paris is a capital of France. But in fact, what we learn when we participate in a complex environment really can only be represented as something complex, like this diagram here, where the actual learning consists of all the different threads, all the different connections. What has been learned quite literally is the set of connections is a certain pattern of activation which is manifest sometimes in the creative output of a sentence like Paris is the capital of France. So to, to, to sort of draw you to what, what I mean by that is sort of the difference between Knowing that, and then again, I, I use that very loosely, Paris is the capital of France, or even knowing how, even having some sort of skill, like how to throw a dart or how to saw a board, it's the difference between that articulation of the knowledge and what it feels like to have that knowledge, what it feels like to be able to throw a dart, what it feels like to wander around France and not have to know where the capital is. Uh, you know, it's the difference between knowing the grammar of a language and what it feels like to be a speaker of a language. Uh, learning the language is this total state, not just the accumulation of individual facts. Now, if the learning of the discipline is a total state and not simply a collection of individual states, then two things seem clear. First of all, it's obtained through immersion in an environment, which is why we use this distributed network of, of resources, of entities, of people. This distributed network is an environment. It is a community of practice. It is a place that in which a person can immerse him or herself and begin participating, conversing, interacting, creating, and the rest. Secondly, if learning, is, if learning a discipline is a total state, then it is going to be expressed functionally rather than cognitively. And what I mean by that is it will be expressed by the fact that you can do the practice of whatever it is. Can you perform as a geographer rather than through the presentation of a set of certain cognitive skills, such as answering questions about geography. Now, that has implications for the assessment of learning. Typically, we assess using a test. We're trying to find out what the cognitive state of a person is. Does a person have that little bit of knowledge? Did the person receive the transmission from that teacher correctly? And it, was that transmission not distorted in some way or somehow forgotten? But if learning is a total state, we can't do that. Uh, if, if knowledge is produced rather than acquired, we can't do that because the knowledge will be produced in different ways by different people. But we know that the knowledge of how to be a geographer, say, is this total state of neural connections. How do we know whether a person has that total state? We look at how they perform in a network of geographers. If they perform in a network of geographers as a geographer, then we can infer that they have that appropriate neural state, that they have drawn the connections. 
What sort of things might signify this? Well, the use of the vocabulary uh, might be appropriate, using the, the, the right words in the right way, um, demonstrating knowledge, uh, you know, doing that cognitive output sort of thing, uh, conversing with other geographers naturally and, and not uh, programmatically. In other words, you know, it's, the, it's like the Dreyfus and Dreyfus expert knowledge. You don't need to think about it, you just know it. And this is manifesting the fact that you can just converse naturally with other geographers. Doing geography, drawing maps without having to look up how to draw a map. All of these things combined go together to suggest that a person has acquired the appropriate mental state. And all of these things combined are what are manifest when a person performs in a social network. But it's important to keep in mind here, there are no necessary conditions, there are no sufficient conditions. You can't say that the knowledge of how to be a geographer is reducible to this, 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 and this testable entity. It's a total performance in a total community. Finally, I'm going to look at what the success factors are of a decentralized learning environment. And, and for those who are familiar with my work, these success factors will also be very familiar to you. Uh, the first success factor is diversity. Again, if we go back to the learning as growing model, uh, we can see that it's evident that you cannot grow when you have only one material to draw from. Uh, you need a mixture of materials. You cannot grow organically from carbon alone or water alone. The only things that grow organically like that are crystals, and all they ever do is replicate themselves. Um, but other things that grow need a wide variety of different materials. Uh, the network must be open. Closed systems become stagnant. Uh, raw materials within the system are depleted, and the system itself becomes clogged with the, uh, if you will, creative product of its members. Uh, because I, I want to say that growth is based not on accumulation. Growth is based on, on flow. Um, we, we grow by adapting to things rather than by accumulating things. Uh, if you, again, if you look at how neural connections are formed in the mind, neural connections are formed in the mind not by amassing a whole pile of salt or a whole pile of carbon or whatever. Neural connections are created when neurons fire together or don't fire together. It's the firing or not firing of these connections that causes the connections to grow or to not grow between neurons. So for a neural network to develop, it needs a constant set of continuously varying uh, experiential infor information coming in. It is this flow that creates the neural connections and not simply the accumulation of the raw materials that give it life. Third condition, autonomy. Uh, the simple cloning of entities does not allow for progress or development. And, you know, this is the whole idea of, of evolution where growth is accommodated by many different entities, each doing slightly different things. And then those entities that are more successful being able to replicate. Each individual entity needs to manage its own growth in its own way. If all the entities march in lockstep, if all the entities do the same thing, then you have a system that is inert. You have a system that is like a rock, not a living thing. And then finally, interactivity. Growth requires that the parts interact, the parts of a system interact. Flowers need bees, cows need green, beavers need trees, etc., etc. Uh, and again, it's the idea here that growth is created not by accumulation, but rather by flow, by constant activation and inter interaction. So that's the uh, success factors, and that wraps up the presentation part of the presentation. And 
Uh, I hope it was interesting and uh, I wasn't interrupted and told to change my topic so I guess uh, I hope my topic was appropriate and I'd certainly uh, be happy to uh, entertain any questions or comments at this time. Okay. Uh, Raphael, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Can go. you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yeah. So, uh, thank you very so, much. Uh, thank you very much. It was a very interesting, was a very uh, lecture. interesting uh, lecture. And now um, we're going to open and for, now we're gonna questions. Open for questions. I'm sorry to interrupt, I'm sorry uh, to interrupt. Stephen. I uh, think that Stephen, we have an uh, eco problem on your part because you don't use a headset. Uh, so uh, if you could so uh, you deactivate, could, your uh, microphone, deactivate your uh, microphone uh, uh, when someone is asking a question, asking perfect. A question perfect. Okay. okay. Uh, so, Raphael, you can continue. Okay, thank you. So, um, I think we have a person, Gary, uh, has a ra raised a hand. So, do you have a question? We have Gary and Annie. Like, you can also write on the whiteboard. Okay, any comments or questions you have, or if you prefer to talk, you can raise your hands, and uh, we'll give you uh, the opportunity to ask your question. Okay. I have a question. So, um, this is Anne Fernley. I want to know how how you uh, deal with knowledge that is needed as a prerequisite for a future course. Well, I mean, um, it's sort of sort of hard to answer that question because it, it presumes, uh, in a certain sense, its own answer. Uh, it, it presumes a model of courses that, that are based on this, this knowledge as transmission model, right? Um, so if you build a course structure where you have prerequisites, then you're building a different kind of system. Uh, you know, if you build a model of, uh, you know, uh, education in a discipline as a sequence of courses where you take one course, then another course, then another course, then you have a system where one course may require a certain amount of knowledge as another from another course. Uh, that's not the model I'm describing here. Uh, the model I'm describing here would not involve there being one course, then another course, then another course. I think a better representation of what I'm describing here would be uh, that a person over time moves from a periphery of a community of practice or social community or social network that revolves around a certain discipline toward the core of that discipline. And so each iteration, if you will, is that moving closer and closer to that core. So if you want to represent prerequisites, uh, really it's that a person is able to demonstrate a capacity to interact in the community at the less engaged level before moving to the more engaged level. You know, I'm, I'm not even willing to say that there are discrete levels here, but you kind of get what I mean, right? Uh, so, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Um, so that's the model that I'm describing here, and, and that's how I would represent prerequisites. But you know, it's obviously it's a very different model. The, uh, the thing is, in that case, you would, it wouldn't be something that you could do just at the CEGEP level. You would have to have it throughout uh, all of the learning experience from elementary school all the way to graduate school, basically. Well, that's right. And so one of the important things to keep in mind, and here I'll actually try to be useful to CEGEP uh, teachers, uh, is to keep in mind that to a large degree, this model and this type of learning uh, insofar as it happens and I think we can point to numerous evidence that numerous instances where it is happening it's going to be happening mostly 
outside the system of formal education. So what should happen, people who are working within the formal discipline should know, observe and attempt to take advantage of this process that's happening outside their own classroom and, and to actually try to place their classroom within the context of this wider, less formal uh, learning environment. Ah, and that's exactly what I was thinking when you were talking, because I was thinking about how I could take some of your ideas and institute forums, for example, where my students could interact and present materials, you know, from different sources and, um, and just kind of give them links where they could get started and stuff like that on, on stuff that's a little bit, uh, would, we would call classically enrichment, but it would actually give them this kind of feel. Sure, and the important component here is that the forums that they're in, the materials that they're looking at, they're not forums and materials that are located inside the class or inside the SAGEP learning system, but are rather uh, forums and materials from the wider community. So the activity that you're undertaking in the class is to attempt in some way to connect them to this wider community and then assist them to increase their participation in this wider community. Indeed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, three questions on the whiteboard and we have one person, uh, Yvonne, uh, would like to ask a question. Um, I had one question. Um, when you talked about the geographer, um, you uh, talked about um, how you perform as a geographer rather than the cognitive skills such as answering specific questions about geography. And then you go on to say about um, there are not specific bits of knowledge or competencies. Uh, but then when you talked about them, how they perform in a network of geographers, you then list using vocabulary and using terms related to being a geographer. So I'm just wondering how, how they come across those terms if, if they're, like where that, where that actually happens. Is it just because they'll become interested and they um, then uh, come across them themselves? Or how, what's the teacher's role, I guess, in all of this? Okay, uh, that's a great question, and uh, I was in a conversation yesterday, and I, I had that question come up as well. And first of all, um, there you know, there's a couple of different parts to to the question. The the, the first uh, is the the origin question, right? How do they come to know? these terms? How do they come to have this knowledge? And the idea here is that uh, typically in a community of practice they begin at the periphery as I said and they begin by observing. They, they watch actual geographers doing actual geographic practice and they attempt to emulate that practice themselves. Uh, they may emulate it privately. They probably wouldn't want to jump to the center of the ge geographical stage to do it. But the idea is that they, they practice doing what they've seen. Uh, they practice talking like geographers. They practice measuring like geographers. Uh, they practice thinking like geographers. And that's where that knowledge comes from. It comes from other geographers. Uh, the system we use now, we use teachers as an intermediary uh, from you know between uh, existing geographers and new geographers uh, but that's a system that has been necessary simply because it's been impossible to have students in the same environment as uh, as actual practicing geographers but with our network technologies now we can actually connect students directly to geographers. Geographers can practice and work openly and in that way uh, function not simply as geographers but also as teachers of geography. So, the, okay, and, okay. And, that, and, and that is then, that is then um, dependent, um, on, the dependent on the openness of the system. The openness of the system. But I know reading about uh, art is my background so reading about old masters I mean they would guard some of their secrets very closely because then they're not actually um, 
rearing the next generation of that's going to compete against them basically and human nature being what it is they try to um keep sort of their area so i don't know how that would work then with the openness so sorry that's all i i just had to ask that yeah and, and that's that's a perfectly legitimate question to ask uh, somebody's got a mic open still um obviously you know there, there's a change in mindset that's happening here uh we're going from an environment in which knowledge is something that is scarce and to be hoarded and where power is derived from being the, the unique and sole possessor of knowledge it's almost knowledge is the mining perspective right to an environment where knowledge is is something uh, that the power is gained from sharing it rather than hoarding it. Uh, you know, it used to be the case that an old master could keep his or her secrets, her her technique secret. Uh, but you know, that's in a much smaller world. In in in, in a world of six billion people it's a lot harder because even if you keep the technique secret somebody else is very likely to come up with the same sort of thing this is this is part of the big confusion that's happening in the patent system today it's not that the people who are getting patents aren't genuine inventors they are the problem is when they invented it another four thousand people at roughly the same time invented the same thing and so it, an effort to hoard stuff creates a bottleneck it, it clogs the production of knowledge it, it clogs uh innovation and so we're going to have to and indeed we are in the process socially of moving from an environment where uh, a practitioner will hoard knowledge to an environment where a practitioner will benefit more from sharing knowledge uh, but you know, to say that that's an easy and straightforward transition would be obviously an exaggeration. Okay. Uh, I, I now we have some the community is not some questions. I just wanted to touch on some one questions. other thing too, um, if that's okay. Sure, please. And, and that's that's on uh, because the the other part of it was I talked about performance in the domain. And then, you know, performance as a geographer. And then, what does that mean? Well, uh, if asked, I'd say speaking the right uh, language, uh, doing the right things. And it really sounds like there's no distinction between the two. And I, I want to be clear that there is a distinction between the two. Um, and and the distinction is this: the the performance in in the community of practice is not characterized by oh no i don't want to say it that way because it is characterized but uh the the performance in the community is not composed of the sum of getting it right saying the right terms etc etc uh the the performance in the community is that plus all other activities within that community. Uh, there's a difference between participating in a community and having all the knowledge that the community has, but not having the sense of that community. It's, a, it's rather hard to explain unless you're an expert in that discipline. And so, uh, it's so hard to explain. This is why I, I probably should have just left it. But, but there is a distinction here. And it's, it's the distinction between being able... Well, oh yeah, okay, I'll do it this way. Uh, how do you know that Fred is your friend? You know, when you see Fred, how do you know it's Fred? Well, Fred has red hair. Fred has freckles. Fred has a funny-looking nose. Uh, Fred is wearing a green shirt. But when you recognize fred it's not because of the red hair the freckle the funny nose the green shirt right you as a friend of fred recognize fred pure and simple you don't break it down that way so yes being fred involves having red hair having freckles having a funny shaped nose and if you're 
if somebody asked you, well, how do you know it's Fred? You would probably say, well, it's the red hair, it's the freckles, it's the nose. But in practice, it's more like a, if you will, snap to awareness. It's a matter of recognition rather than enumerating a set of factors. And so that's the distinction I'm trying to draw here. Knowing the right terms, um, solving geographical problems, these are all factors, but you can't just enumerate those factors to say so-and-so is a geographer. The way you know that so-and-so is a geographer is that somebody who is already a geographer recognizes that so-and-so is a geographer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So now we have some questions so on the whiteboard. The, the white white first board. one is from Norman Spatz from, from, from Prof. Web. Norman writes, I Norman find that's wonderful that you're so enthusiastic about this model, but, but what do you do to water the plan to, to encourage plan, ready to participation ready when it seems to be flagging? You may well have set it up. Oh, it's the old motivation question. One of the major reasons that I believe that learning should be self-directed is that learning that is self-directed rarely flags in the way that you describe. That doesn't mean that people are always enthusiastic and always motivated, but typically they're typically much more motivated to do something of their own choosing than to do something that they've been told to do. So I think that most of the motivation problem is solved by the application of the autonomy principle. Uh, allowing people autonomy generally will solve the problem of motivation. Um, I'm not sure what else to say. Maybe if you want to follow that up more, uh, we could. But sure. that's generally how uh, I would address can you, that question. Can you can you hear can me? You hear me? Yes, Norms, go ahead. Yes, Norms, go ahead. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so, so what, 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 what gets, gets me about, about this, this is having, having gone, gone through, through uh, a, a number, number of, of um, uh, I, would I would say, say uh, strategies, strategies in my classroom, my classroom that, that, that I, I, I would say reproduce what you're, what you're talking, talking about, about because, because uh, I didn't really, really know, know it, it but, but where, where you, you, you try to make uh, learners uh, much more independent and much more focused on creating their own content. But then I always find that I, I wind up in the situation where I am creating a network and in effect you create, you, you, you almost wind up making other students in your class dependent on product being created by you know, by by members of the class and that's fine until you get someone that breaks the chain and doesn't produce and then when they're not producing it's sort of like this this uh, train wreck effect where because they haven't produced then somebody else can't do their work and you know it backfires back and forth and I saw that you're talking about multiple inputs but I, I really, I mean, do you do, when you were setting up that course, did you do a planning and say, well, how many uh, inputs do I have to have where I don't have to start, you know, sending out emails to my students saying, well, where the hell is it? You know, it's, um, it's, it's how closely did you ride range on what your students were doing? And I guess the, the corollary of that is, and in the end, and I, I know I'm really talking from uh, a Seja perspective, how did you grade them? On that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have the convenience of turning off my webcam and bugging out and listening to your question, listening to your answer. Okay. First of all, we've got to understand that you're talking from a perspective of inside a Seja class. And that's a very different environment. I mean, you're, you're working within a very small closed system. If you were working in a wider open system, there is no shortage of material. Now, it's not being produced by your students, but it is being produced. This is the internet. You know, we have a billion pages being produced every day. Uh, stuff is being produced. There's no shortage of stuff being produced. What happens, though, is you may well have set it up in a situation where the only productive factors in, in your network were your own students. So you set up a very small closed network. And so 
that that creates you know the the shortage of raw material that I was talking about and and uh, uh, and you identified you know I mean one person doesn't produce and the whole system breaks down so you know it should not depend on whether each individual student in your classroom produces now of course now that's going to produce the grading problem but again that's a different model uh, that's a model where you're you're looking at what kind of knowledge they have achieved and assessing to a numerical degree how well they have obtained that knowledge uh, in a sage app you're probably going to have to do that um, in uh, now and with, with the connectivism course we George and I did not worry about what individual students contributed or did not contribute, but the University of Manitoba required that students submit work for grading, and that's what happened. Students submitted work for grading. They had two assignments and a final project. They submitted these for grading, and they were graded. Um, and so they produced stuff and we gave them the choice of whether to produce this publicly for consumption by everybody else, the, all the other 2,200 people in the course, or privately just for the instructor. And some chose the former and others chose the latter. Uh, the grading structure, in other words, was imposed on the connectivism course from the outside. Uh, for my own part, again, um, I would not assess learners through grading. I, I don't think that that is, in the long term, the best way to assess learners. And, and I don't believe that that's the way that society at large actually evaluates learners. Uh, I cannot recall, and I've done lots of hiring in my time, I cannot recall actually looking at a student's grades for anything. Uh, it just didn't matter. I was much more interested in whether they were able to do the work. And I was finding out if they were able to do the work by looking at whether, in fact, they did the work. And, and that, in general, especially as we, we become a more connected society, that, in general, is how learning is assessed. You know, the grading model, uh, you know, it, it, you have one or maybe a small number of evaluators, and this evaluation occurs according to you know very precise indications, you know questions and answers and grades on specific bits of work, and this is exactly the opposite of the sort of assessment that I, I described in this paper where. Uh, a person is evaluated not by an individual, by a community, and not by specific inputs, but rather on their overall performance within this particular network or particular community of practice. And there weren't gradings per se, but as a person closes the participation gap and moves from the periphery of such a community toward the center of the community, they obtain more opportunities to connect with, to work with other people at the center of the community. And that is the instantiation of this community evaluating the, the learning that has taken place by that learner. So it's a completely different sort of question. Now, practical reality. Uh, how do you do grading uh, if you're a SAGEP instructor and you've got a bunch of students and, and you think this is still a good model, but you do have to do this grading thing. The way I would set it up is, first of all, as mentioned before, encourage people, you know, help people participate in these external communities, connect them to external forums, things like that. But then do what we did in the, in the uh, connectivism course, give them a way to bring their contributions to these external networks back into the course. And what I did is I had each of them provide me with an RSS feed or a number of RSS feeds from their blog or from the community, the forums they were participating in. And I would take these RSS feeds and aggregate it. 
And now I have a body of material from that student that has been presented in an authentic community, a community of practice out there in the world that represents that student's participation in that community. And now I have something I can grade. And that's the way I would approach it. And then if a person does not contribute, they don't take down the whole class, they, they just fail to impact that wider community. If a person does contribute, then they're actually helping that wider community, presumably, assuming it's a positive contribution. Uh, and, and you're able to see that contribution and assess it for what it is. So I, I think that's it's two ways of answering the question. I think that's as, as comprehensive an answer as I can provide. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, we have another question from Philippe Gagné. Uh, what type of learning do you have in mind to hone its intended to adults mostly lifelong learning yeah uh, it's long been said and, and, and certainly with some justification that uh, less experienced learners are less able to manage their own learning and so an approach to learning such as the one described here really applies to adults or lifelong learners and if you take you know a snapshot of, of the current student population that's probably true uh, you know my experience certainly with uh, first-year students indicates to me that you know they, they come into college or university not ready to think critically for themselves so it's sad but it's true that doesn't mean they they all can't but certainly a significant percentage of them can't and you know if i was teaching a first year philosophy class it would be folly for me to just leave them to their own devices the first thing they would do is complain to the dean that i'm not teaching them uh and, and i'm sure you've all had that experience and, and it would be foolish to to belie that experience but that does not mean that I accept that situation as it stands. And my feeling is, my belief is that if at a much younger age we instilled in children the capacity to think and learn on their own, to be critically reflective, to be creative, to, to have all of these skills that we want of graduates, uh, that they would, by the time they're older, certainly by the time that they uh, entered college, be able to direct their own learning. And, and, and so then this kind of learning could apply to them. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's going to be one of these uh, long-term things that, you know, can only be measured empirically. And so the answer to the question, what type of learner do you have in mind, can really only be, uh, the type of learner who is capable of learning in this way, which right now is a minority and right now tends to be focused at the higher stage uh, of, of learning, but which with appropriate preparation, I think, could be pushed down to the very low grade levels, I think, eventually. Thank you. Uh, now uh, I have a person who would like to ask a question, uh, Enrique. Please go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to uh, make his question. The question is, uh, who is responsible for filtering the validation thesis representation for production knowledge? The social node or the student? This is a question from Enrique Ruiz Velasco Sanchez. Uh, I want to say everyone. Um, the social node or the students? That's a fascinating way of putting it. Um, the, the, the picture being presented in this question is that there is a process of, well, filtering, validation, synthesis, etc., that is required prior to the production or the presentation of knowledge and information to the student. And I would argue that really what should happen is that the student should be given as early as possible the capacity to do this for him or herself. I, I think that the, the, the critical literacies 
are the, the fundamental elements of knowledge, the, the capacity to, to understand what is said in the sentence, to, to evaluate that reflectively, etc., um, to, to validate, synthesize, all the rest of it. So I don't think that there should be necessarily a, uh, a, a screening process applied for the benefit of students. I think students should apply the screening process themselves and then out of that screening process produce their own knowledge. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, is, is that, a, does that work? Does that answer the question? Enrique, is that okay? Can you um, like to talk or like to write on the whiteboard? Is that a, the answer is fine for you? I appreciate your, your, your answer. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you, Enrique. Uh, we have another question right now. It's from uh, Sharon Coyle from Satil. Uh, the question is, so could the classroom be viewed as a hub or a node in this web of a real learning community? Can a teacher be a practicing expert modeling the way of being for that community? Yeah, so uh, I was kind of thinking, it's hard to do what you were talking about, Stephen, uh, like you said, in a classroom situation. So uh, if you can't be the whole network, can you just be at least uh, an element within that network, network and open your students up to the network? I guess is kind of what I was thinking. Um, e even if we can't be the, the perfect whole network scene, can we get them in connection with practicing communities and and like you said model like what the geography what a ge ge no, what do you call it geology no I don't know <laughs> what the geographer does you know if I'm a, a literature professor I model uh, reading and writing and get them to practice it in as real ways as possible like having I have them write stories and go read them in elementary school classrooms so they become a reader and a writer uh, in reality that was my question yeah, um, the short answer to your question is yes. <laughs> uh, the longer answer has two parts, and you touched on both, which is why the shorter answer is yes. Uh, first of all, uh, yeah, absolutely, connecting them with these wider communities, uh, giving them giving them opportunities to participate. Uh, I think these things are really important and will help them. Uh, you know, engage with these communities and learn not just from you, but from the wider community. The second part, which I haven't really touched on so much, is uh, in your own conduct as an instructor, this model would have you acting first as a practitioner and secondly as a teacher, if that makes sense. What I mean by that is uh, what I think would be a best practice would be to 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 demonstrate the sort of participation in this wider network that you want to encourage in your students so your students should see you you know if you're if you're a geographer teaching geography your students should see you participating in this network of geographers uh, being a geographer doing geography like things out there in the world and then when you come back to your classroom instead of standing there and talking to them about that or, you know about geography uh, you can point them to what you did in this community say look at what I did here see this is kind of what I have in mind or take a look at this project here that I worked on that's kind of what I have in mind so being the practitioner in the community of practice rather than the teller of uh, information about that practice. I, I think that would be a significant change in, in the way a lot of people approach teaching a certain discipline. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we have another person right now. Another question is Murat. Please go ahead. Hi. Um it's actually a comment about um, the question of participation and uh, it's related to the a little bit uh, to the question of norm about participation 
question again. I myself, when I heard the when I saw the emphasis that uh, Stephen placed on participation and engagement, I felt that that could uh, be could um, might 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 be a problem. Might lead to a problem. In my view, in my view, in my personal view, participation is not uh, really or engagement are not really that important. And in 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 in. Um, in, re in replying, in, in responding to the to the comment made by Norm, I might say that uh, we don't, even if production or participation or contribution do not happen, that is not a problem. Uh, that is not a problem if we recognize the importance of consumption and use, because consumption and use in themselves, if made visible, they can turn into a contribution that may benefit the whole community of learners. So on the ones, even even a lurker, even someone who is passive, who is not contributing, but he's using the information made available but, uh, by other more active users in the network, if that consumption is made visible, through and there are many mechanisms that can make that possible, then uh, participation uh, or engagement will not be that important. So that's, uh, I don't know what Stephen thinks about this uh, question, uh, because uh, he, he talked in the beginning about the importance of engagement and then about participation, but I do not see that that is, um, th th that has an importance, but it's not very, very important if we, if we can make use of consumption, of use itself. Use itself can be made useful to others. Thank you. Yeah, don't go away. Um, what I'm wondering is, what is the distinction that you would draw between use and activities and engagement? Use is passively consuming the contributions of others in the network. So you're here, you're lurking, you're just watching, you're following the your your the RSS feeds, you're consuming without producing. So you're not participating. Maybe, I mean, you're not actively participating. You're not producing yourself. But if we, if through some certain mechanisms which are, which are available, uh, your, your passive consumption is made visible to others. For example, there are I don't know. I won't go into details about the mechanisms that can make use, passive use, visible and useful. But uh, this is the idea. This is the difference I see between use and and participation. Sorry. You, you can measure consumption. Like you can do things like page views or you know time on site or you know yes. even eye tracking yes. if you really want to get fancy. Um, so, so you know, there are ways of getting at consumption, but, you know, I don't think people would equate consuming uh, certain content with using that content, and I think that very few people would agree that we would recognize that a person has learned a certain body of content simply from the fact that they have consumed it. Even traditional education has the requirement that you actually produce something, if, even if it's nothing more than uh, you know, uh, a test result. And so really the, the question that, that I find that I'm facing is the question not whether or not a person needs to produce something, but rather which kind of production by the learner are more accurate indications of whether that learner has uh, managed to acquire that particular skill, capacity, or body of knowledge. Uh, I, I don't think, you know, that's not to say there is no value in what might be called a lurking behavior and a lurking behavior is certainly recognized as as a valid behavior and you know a, a peripheral participation but we would certainly assess that there is a very wide participation gap here between somebody who simply lurks and does not offer any evidence of their uh, you know of their capacity to act in the discipline 
and a person who actually does actively participate, either minimally by answering questions on an exam or maximally by participating in the community itself. And it's not, you know, I mean, the, the word engagement has a connotation and, and people think of the word engagement as, you know, uh, jumping in and participating in class discussions or things like that, engagement in the community that is the class. And that, you're right, that doesn't matter uh, particularly. But there needs to be, I think, some engagement at some level with some community, either internally or externally or somewhere. Otherwise, there, you know, the two things aren't happening. First of all, the necessary practice and reflection with the material isn't happening. The person isn't testing their knowledge against any real world circumstances. So the person isn't able to assess for themselves, much less than for others, whether they actually got the concept. Now this might be, you know, if you're teaching bicycling, this might be the person going out in private and trying a bicycle out and seeing if you can actually stay balanced or whatever. You know, it might be just trying something out, you know, maybe sitting in their room privately writing a computer program. That still counts as practice. Um, but, uh, you know, with, without that, you know, so the person is, is not able to actually validate for themselves their own learning. And then secondly, they, they've produced no external evidence whatsoever that they have learned. And, and we have no mechanism other than their participation in some way to assess whether uh, you know, they have consumed or merely been present in the room where the information was delivered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you have more questions? Comments, questions? Okay. Well, I have one question, just to... Um, how do you see the, the role of uh, the course management systems like Moodle, for example, in this new uh, connectivism theory? Like, is there a role for Moodle there, or do you think like the, the personal learning environments like are going to replace totally the the course management systems as we know nowadays? Thank you. Yeah, what what I think we're going to see is that. Um, institutional learning management systems are going to play the role of institutionally provided content repositories. So what will happen is a person will use their own personal learning environment and among the external sources uh, that they will access will be these learning management systems. So we might think of a learning management system as a PLE for the institution. Uh, it'll be the way the institution projects its content and, and its activities into the mesh of interacting users, the interacting learners. Perfect, thank you. So I guess we're finished our presentations like 1.30. Uh, I'd like to ask you to everybody to open their webcams. We're going to register uh, everybody here. So let's see. I think some people don't have any webcams, so we're more yeah, people some, yeah, than. Yeah, uh, maybe some people, yeah. yeah. We have currently 22 people. Okay. So, Stephen, thanks a lot. <laughs> it was great. So thank you, and uh, I, I hope everyone enjoyed that, and uh, it was my pleasure to be able to present here. I'd like it was to really mention interesting. That we Thanks, Stephen. Thank you very much. Thank I'd you, like Stephen. I'd like to mention, Stephen, we had people from uh, CETIL, which is at the, uh, I think you know where CETIL is, and we had people from Gatineau, so we had, uh, we had participants from all over Quebec here. And uh, that's cat. my cat who has decided to join in the presentation. Well, there we go. We had people from Moncton as well.
<laughs> and we had someone from Mexico City. So we'd like to thank you. And uh, it was I know it was very generous of you. On, on top of it, you were sick. So I think it was incredible that you made it and you, you stayed for the whole hour and a half. So we have to thank you and uh, tell you we're grateful. So thanks to Rafael for the animation from the, uh, from the Dawson College. And maybe in the thank future you. we can have just a discussion. Thanks, Rafael. We could have a discussion, Stephen, instead of a presentation. I think a lot of people would like to ask more questions and we'll have time to think about it. So maybe in the near future we could uh, log on just for a discussion and exchange of thoughts. How, what do you sure, think that, that would be now? great. It's a lot easier for me to prepare for. Yeah, <laughs> we'll prepare. Okay, I'd like to thank all the participants to make uh, this event quite successful. It, we're just starting, but we're quite uh, happy with the number of participants. And I hope that you've uh, been learning a lot and that you'll be logging on. And uh, I think uh, I'll be posting the events coming in the next uh, month or so. We'll have Philip Gagné, who will be talking about uh, blended uh, learning. We'll have Elizabeth Charles from Dawson, who will um, talk about the uh, classroom she set up at Dawson for, um, from uh, the model at MIT. And we have many more people coming in to, uh, to talk to you and to exchange with you. So thanks again, Stephen. It was a great pleasure, and we enjoyed it. So thanks to all the participants as well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Go and have a good tea, Stephen. <laughs> you deserve it. <laughs>